yeah, yeah. asking for help is the strongest thing I ever did because I took therapy when I was younger about six years ago and then I've got a life coach now which is the best thing I ever did so I'll pass that information on to people I see suffering because a lot of them think I can't sit. I should be doing that I should be thinking like this I just want this and I'm saying that. that's not normal that's normal but it's also not normal not to do anything about it welcome to another episode of the burn chef journal hosted by myself Chris Hall the founder of The Burnt Chef Project. This week's guest is no other than Sat Baines, who I previously shared a chat with on the staff canteen. His insight into how a business within hospitality should be run is refreshing and progressive. And I do believe that more businesses should take a note from how Sat operates with his teams in order to improve staff well-being. The chat is insightful, there's tons of useful information in there with regards to how to structure your teams, how to look after your your own well-being and that of others. It was a pleasure to have him on board. As always, I hope you enjoy this chat. Hi Sat, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Happy New Year. It's, uh, yeah, it's a strange old world out there at this moment in time. But you and I have literally been just talking offline and we've missed so so much good stuff, so we were... uh, (laughs) We're here, we're talking to you about, I know you've got a pretty strong focus on sort of waste and environment, but what you and I have perhaps spoken to together before in the staff canteen chat about is attention to your staff in terms of their well-being, their mental health, your mental health, retention, um, and it's sort of what, what I'd know you for, um, more so than anything else, if I'm honest. So um what prompted me to get in contact with you i was listening to the nightcap podcast with nal keating fairly recently and he was talking about his time with you and also talking about the time where you know he came to you with his notice and then he told he took it back and you told him no you've got to hand in your notice and go for these opportunities to learn and grow and i thought you know i need to speak to you and i think (laughs) a lot of what you have to say about well-being, about management, about hospitality and how you run your business, I think that a lot of people could benefit from. So thank you for joining me. On no, this thank you. Not at all. So we were just talking uh, just off air a moment ago uh, and we covered so many different topics already, such as, you know, encouraging people to be able to be free to fail and to grow within the workplace environment in terms about, you know, working with efficiencies and Let's just go back to where we were originally, because one thing that struck, struck me when we started the talk is you said that you never had a mentor. Yeah, so I was very fortunate is a word I'm going to use because I was a head chef at 24 in a restaurant in Nottingham. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was a fucking cowboy and all the rest. I read Marco, started making fucking lemon tart to order. It was ridiculous, but it was good fun, you know. And, and I applied for a job at Le Petit Blanc in Oxford that was just opening I did that for six months. I was part of a team that opened, opened a Petit Blanc in Jericho. Then I went to Lascargo for three months. But I never really had a mentor per se where I had a, 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 um, a chef that was established at one, two or three star level where they nurtured you and you went through the ranks and worked your way through the entremetier, through to the through to the, the meat section, fish section and ended up on sauce, whatever, and then became a sous chef. So I've had a massive chunk missing from a traditional upbringing but then I entered the Rue Scholarship, which is the most sacred. And I think we should mention Albert uh, today. That our, you know, our heart goes out to the whole Rue family. Uh, we heard today that he, he's passed and uh, another legend of our industry that's gone. And, uh, you know, we're, we're part, I'm part of that legacy. I'm part of his and the Rue Scholarship and all that. And I take that very seriously. So by having taken on the Rue Scholarship and then winning, then I went to a three-star for three months. And then there was all the hierarchy. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. But that was it. I was 28 and I was a head chef of a restaurant in Nottingham where I'm still at. So I had a massive chunk missing. So when I have chefs come in and they've worked in a two star or a three star and they want a trial, I say to them, you know, cook me a, a veal sweetbread, cook me a piece of fish or cook me a scallop. They tend to always, we all do it because it's natural. You tend to go to the last place you worked and you do a dish similar to where you were on the section. See, I never had that. So whereas I had to learn on the job. So for the last 21 years at the restaurant in, in Lenton, and even today, I'm still learning. You know, I had to learn what sweetbreads were. I had to use lamb sweetbreads first, the, the one in the neck, and then the one from the pancreas, and then went on to sweetbreads that were the veal. And then you learn about everyone saying poach them or blanch them or press them. 
But I thought, well, all you're doing that for is taking the membrane off and to, to stabilize the protein or the, 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 the kind of organ meat. So I started skinning it like a fish and it works. You can, you know, you get, you get the knife under, flexible knife, and it was untouched. It's not had no heat to it. You can then put it into a little bit of flour, pan fry it. It's got this incredible crust on it. So you save the process. And I talked about earlier before we went on, on a, a live. As a chef, you're always trying to work efficiently, quick. But then there's got to be a point where you say, okay, I've filled it to the red money really fast. Now what? And that's where I come in. That's my he- mindset pops into that bit. Now let's cook. Because, okay, you can do that. It's really good. But now what we're going to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And one thing that, you know, we, again, we touched upon it briefly, but one thing that's, I guess, I always come back to the fact that the hospitality industry, we're so, um, we react to the moment in time. We're a reactive industry. We don't tend to, whilst we're planning for this weekend's covers or tomorrow's covers, we're never really looking that far ahead in the future. And as a result, we tend to be looking so far back uh, about well this is the way it used to be done this is how we yeah. learned this is how we were this is how we were made to feel ashamed or or naughty that we'd made a mistake and we were banished to you know banished to because don't forget it was a military system you know when Scofield brought it in it was back in the day it was it was a militarized system it worked you know sous chef was head and and and, and you know second in charge and, and head uh, chef de cuisine was the chef means head so it was all based on hierarchy. So there was a lot of discipline and, and that's obviously translated all the way through the times. But then you're looking now. Why? Yes, it's worked, but you've got to look at the ratio of how many chefs it's produced to how many chefs we've lost. Mm. And that's the key factor. And if you are a young cook and you're 18 and you're struggling because you've just moved from home, gone into a two-star restaurant, and as a chef, I can see someone struggling and say, everything okay, chef, I think I might get out of the trade. I'm missing my mates. Of course you're going to miss your mates because you've, you're now in a trade where you're working together four or five days a week. You're now living in a flat. Your mum and dad are in wherever, Southampton or Luton, wherever it is, and you're now missing that. So we've got to recreate the family forum. And the way to do that is have a very tight bond with the team, offer them incredible working hours, really good pay. That's above what they would normally get on a, on a basic wage and also make the business viable that they feel that they are part of something very special. And, you know, my wife, she's probably 10 times better as a manager than me because she will walk through and spend a couple of minutes with each member of the team. And just to see their, you know, we haven't got backers. We haven't got loads of managers. It's just me and Amanda and John, my head chef and two managers out front and the head smelly. So they're the senior team. We're there every day. And you can, you've got access to me, Amanda, John, every day. So if you say, chef, can I have a word? Yeah, of course you can. What do you want? Not sats in every Wednesday. And you almost then have that issue where you're scared to approach the chef because he only comes in every Wednesday. Yeah, and yeah. he almost looks too busy as the boss that he's no longer the chef. He's like the boss. So you yeah. then now put this barrier up between you and the staff. They are then nervous about saying, Shaq, I'd really like to have a word with you. Well, listen, the hierarchy is you go to John. What do you want me for? So you say, well, what do you want? What's up? And they say, well, I'm thinking of moving on. Okay, what's, what's the matter? I've been offered this or I've had enough. I'm going on a ski chalet, whatever it is. But if you lose that interaction of being open and having that open forum, that kind of two-way kind of street where you can communicate, that's when I think things become an issue and, and, and barriers get put up and you lose, you lose people. I, I've seen in the past. And I think it's such a shame that, that that's there. You know, we're fortunate. We're a four day week. That means you work hard for four days. And obviously this is when we're open, yeah. but it means you've got three days off and everyone's the same. So, and also, you know, I, I talked about this a lot because say you are in a kitchen, that's a seven day or six day operation. And I gave you a four day week. On your last day off, I know this for a fact because it happened to me, is you're starting to worry about 12, 2 o'clock on your day off is what shit you're going to be left in. What Because yeah. that guy that you're going to replace on Wednesday, say, he's off. So you might not see this guy for six days, but he's left you right in the shit because he knows he's off. He don't give a fuck. You've had three days off, you jammy fucker. Do you know what I mean? It's all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that hatred, and you, that negativity. You walk, you walk in, you're absolutely in the shit. So what you do, you, 
you text him on your day off and you could be with your missus like in the park and she knows because you've gone now your eyes are gone mm. and your mental state's gone because you're now at work yeah because you're worrying about fuck what's he done what's he left me with what's she left me with and you text him what how many's in tomorrow have you got everything? What do I need? You mean to make meals? You mean to make that? Got 48 raviolis. I mean, all of a sudden you then start getting anxious. Yeah. You go to bed early. Your missus is there going, no, you're right. Everything all right? He goes, yeah, yeah, just, you know, I've got a busy day tomorrow. So by closing, it's, it's the, that line. Everyone's together. There's, and also there's... you all come back together. Yeah, yeah. So you all yeah. walk back in on Wednesday morning at seven o'clock, absolutely together. And if one's in the shit, the sous chef jumps in helps that person out then that person if he's now on top he helps the fish guy out i've always said it's not it's never been about the restaurant or accolades it's about the food and it's our food it's not i'm on fish i'm all right jack because that's how it used to be the meat meat guy's gone down but the meat guy's got a dish to put onto the same plate as the fish guy to send out together but now he's put the fish over so why don't it make sense that you jump in on the fish or me and help him out so you're crescendo together? Because the food surely is the most important thing in a restaurant. Not the hierarchy, the accolade, the chef's attitude, the ego. And as soon as we changed and shifted all that, the, 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 the kind of performance level went through the roof because I said to you earlier, as we look, I look at myself as a collaborator. So forget the title, head chef or patron or whatever. I collaborate with my chefs all the time. So I ask questions. We talk about a new dish. We ask certain chefs to do different parts of that dish. We put it together and we all have a view. And if you ask the young guy at 18 years old, he said, what do you think, chef? I think, oh, yeah. When I was in the south of France and I went to that three-star, we're like, what? You've been to three-star? How, how would you know he's been to that three-star if you never gave him the chance to talk to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Him. It's that, it's that, if we all love food and we're all in cooking for the same reason where we love cooking, we want to get better, we want to have a restaurant one day, I want to feed people, I want to make sure they have this gastronomy experience where they go, fuck me, how did you do that to that beautiful piece of lettuce or how do you dress it or whatever? That's your skill. So if we can share that and create this culture in the restaurant where we're giddy about next week that, oh my God, we've got some Langstein's coming in. Yeah. That's like, that's like the, I think it's the soul. It's the soul of a kitchen. It's the, it's the feeling of, fuck me, I can't wait to get back next week because we've got the length scenes in, or we've got all the white truffles in, or we've got sparrow style, or we've got, you know, we've got some incredible fennel that's been grown by the gardener that I'm going to use on my section, and all the pollen, or we've got the honey coming in. Do, do you know what I mean? It's like keeping the love affair going, even though you're in the shit. That you yeah. don't get bogged down with your mundane tasks because that's the stifler. Is my mise en place is so big now I'm rushing? That means you're cutting corners. Yeah, and that's where the cracks start to show. And then you're not giving the products, you know, the products, the dedication uh, and the care yeah. and the love that you need to. And you've lost the love of the affair of why you fell in love with wanting to cook. It's a weird thing, isn't it? Because restaurants, you know, you think about it, like if you cooked at home, like, we, work, we worked with some um, psychologists. We're still working with them. Obviously, everything's on hold. Is I said, I think there's an ingredient missing in most kitchens, and it's love. So when you're at home and you're cooking a beautiful little bolognese or a soup, you're cooking it for your partner or your family, you're going to add that element of love, which is like nurture, like season it, let it rest, whatever. We haven't got that skill. We haven't got that time at the restaurant. But let's create that time. yeah. So I say to the guys, every time you roast that piece of mallard, you almost want to be jealous of the guests and you fucker, they're going to eat this. I wish I was eating it. So you, you know that obsession of, oh, I wish I was, oh my God. It's, and then when the chef that's cooked it, carved it, he's rested it, carved it. And it's fucking incredibly pink. And it's got a little crust on the skin and it's seasoned. The, that joy of him wanting to say, oh my God, guys, I fucking nailed one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, it's all, you want like to capture that, yeah. It's like you're and, sat with the guests. What contagious, to... yeah, throughout the whole team going, oh, my God, Jonathan, whoever he is on the, on the fucking grill chef, nailed the mallard today. Oh, I can't wait to go on the fucking... I hope he shows me how to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so about it... creating that contagious attitude of every single 
element of every single dish, every single day is important. And every single one of us is, is responsible for it. It's about putting the service back in the service industry, isn't it? And yeah, it's, it's like, you know, there's a te- I, was, I had a speech a few months ago before COVID and I was really pissed off because the chefs were leaving the fridge a mess and all that shit and they were not taking responsibility. Because listen, just so we all know, we are all responsible for every single thing here. If the drain's leaking and you know it's come away from its attachment, you get a ladder, you get someone to hold it, and you put that la- that drain back in because you're responsible for it because you saw it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, when you have that culture, things get done. Like, chef, there's a latch next to me. I see the sous chef with a little screwdriver putting the latch on the window back. Then I see one of the chefs brushing up because he's made a mess with the coal. And that's the love. That's They will have their own place ultimately one day. And I want them to understand it's not just about cooking. It's a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's a way of nurture. It's a way of producing people that are collectively driven to be the best they can be. And if you get that gel right with that team, you can create some incredible, incredible memories. See, I was about to ask you whether or not the Escoffier system still had a place within within the hospitality world. But I think based on what you've just said, it does have a place. But the place needs to be, if it is a military based system, then it needs to be in a similar vein to the military where we don't bitch about each other, where if there are issues, we work together as a team to get them sorted rather than trying to chastise each other for having those mistakes. I think we've, we've almost taken the the worst elements from a military system. And I think it's changed a lot. And I've, I've seen that because I've been a chef 34 years. So I've seen it in my kitchen. So I've seen it where you get two chefs, they've both got arrogance and the ego and they want to the chest is out. And I just say, listen, you either, and I did it years ago. And it was hilarious. I took a video. I goes, you either kiss or you fight for two minutes on the car park. And they kissed. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> that was it. You're, I'm not having no <laughs> bullshit in that kitchen where, he said, she said, listen, you deal with it. If I hear about it, that means obviously he's got past the sous chef, has got past John Mad chef. Hang on, what's going on here? What's the beef here? Well, he did that with my fucking... I'm going, oh, stop there. You're not children. Mm. If, if he's done something wrong, he needs to apologise. If you've taken it a bit too seriously, you need to calm down. Because it's, it's a melting pot, isn't it, of very different characters, and that's what you remember. And they're, they're in a confined area, even though the spaces are big. They just work together. They've got to trust each other. And all it takes is the word of disrespect. Mm. Someone took a leniency or or an inch of disrespect and someone harboured it, the way they said something or the way you're you're in the shit on your set show and someone asks you, can I boy, yeah, fucking just take it, mate. Do do you know what I mean? And then you then, fucking Marley Bastard, and all of a sudden you then think, he's a bit touchy. But all it would take is him to come around and say, listen, I'm really sorry about earlier, I snapped to you. Because and it's not about Molly Codlin, it's about human interaction. Kitchens are hard because of the discipline it takes to produce food at that level. That's a fact. I don't think you can get food personally without that discipline. You've got to look at waste. You've got to look at spoilage in terms of not being looked after properly. Waste, is it being trimmed? Are they throwing away more than they need to? Things like that. So are they in the shit? Are they cutting corners? You've got to almost have a radar and and look for things like that because that's where the crisis has happened. So how do you spread the workload evenly between your team so they are all almost at the same level of workload, but then we've always got two senior chefs spare that can jump in and they can take pressure off. And that's an investment. Yeah, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier about providing that ability for your structures are set up so so that in a way that your members of staff not only have an equal workload, but they also have this ability to, one, fail without fear of losing their jobs, but also, yeah. two, there's opportunity with the senior members of staff to upskill those who yeah. perhaps need a better level of resilience with, you know, if they are struggling with a particular section, then you have that senior member of staff who can step in and go, look, I'm going to take you out of this for five minutes. Yeah. Watch how I do it. What else can we do to help you improve? And I think that's something that... But to you... watch it happen in real life and see a senior member of the team nurture a young kid 
is the most beautiful thing you can imagine. Because they're not standing there fucking effing and blind into the face. They're saying, listen, we need to get it through that. What do you need? And he goes, okay, I need four more plates. I need this. Get the caviar out. Whatever it is. Get pickle turnip. We need this. I need got one more crab on. And slow the service down. Give them extra two minutes. No one knows out of the restaurant. Tell the maitre d' table four is going to be a little bit late. But just go and have a chat with them. They won't know. The whole restaurant is one front and back and since we got the first lockdown we went back and I worked with Rene at the Jordan de Sons in 1999 as a stagiaire when I won the Roo scholarship so me and Rene met just by chance mm. he went on Open Noma when he opened Noma the first first month he, he rang me and he sat because I just started at the restaurant he was sat I, I use the chefs for service because I can't get them and they're the best guys because they know how to cook everything and I held back for 20 years before I put a chef in the front of the house. And it's only now I feel comfortable because Amanda, my wife, will want them trained as waiters. Yeah, yeah. She don't want a chef that's got fucking dirty fingers, food on his beard, and fucking stinks of fish going over to a table to say, oh, how's your evening? Well, it was better till you turned up, you fucker. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put a damper on it. It's the whole... We're all one. And we, when, we, when we've had quieter months, we'll get the front of the house in and they'll do dates in the kitchen. They'll prep food, they'll make a sauce, they'll prep the, the eel. So then they, when they're talking to the guests, all of a sudden, oh yeah, well actually I did this one, what? And then like the customers are blown away by that shit because it's like trying not to make, what we're trying not to do is fake anything. And there's also no reason to do it. We're not doing it because we're, people are watching us or it's going to be on a TV program. It's, it's about genuinely loving what we do and passing on that as, to as many people that are willing to listen, willing to be nurtured and trained, and then hopefully take a bit of that with them. Like we talked earlier, you know, the legacy of the restaurants, and it's not down to me, it's down to the team and the culture we've, we've cultivated. Amanda, what she does with the team. We've, we've created quite a few brilliantly talented people that have left and gone on all over the world. And we're very, we're very proud of that. Yeah. But there's a reason because they've come, they come at the right time or something clicked or they like the style of the management. They feel they were valued. They can still call us five, 10, 15 years later. How are you doing, chef? The, do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, like, like hospitality should be. I mean, we always, we say we're family, right? And we look out for each other and it's, we spend more time with each other, bloody hell. We spend more time yeah. with each other than we do with anyone else. But what you actually have there is a proper family, whereas... But don't forget, I've had to learn this as well. I wasn't yeah, like yeah. this from day one. I've had to go through the bits where probably my Ramsey-esque era where you think shouting to them, but it didn't work because they never fucking learned. They never, they never got it. Because... Yeah. You just you just like that, and then if you just like that, they go, "Oh, fucking chef's kicking off again." You don't want them to switch off. You want them to stay engaged. And the key is that nurture is. I think teaching someone has got to be one of the biggest gifts you can get, have, because you're in a very privileged position mm. to teach someone to make a beautiful sauce or a blute or a sauce that we make now, which is like a curry butter sauce. And one of our lads, Charlie, he makes it. And it's better than mine, but he just fucking nails it because he loves it. And when we made it, we made it up. And I was going, quick, give me some tomatoes. And quick, give me some coconut milk. And he's like, and he was writing it down, him and, him and Ash. And they're writing it down. Like, fucking, what's he putting there now? Like, yeah, shit, yeah. it's put some... And then when you ended up pureeing it and you passed it through a sieve and they tasted it, they went, fuck me, shit. I was like, okay, you're making the next one. And then a couple of times it wasn't right because the garam masala or something wasn't, wasn't, didn't, didn't, didn't hit. Because, again, I deal with flavours as memories and, and I don't look at it as I've had it before. I, I try to look at it, like, what do I want? What do I want with this dish? What's the story it's going to tell at this point in the menu? And then, you, then you're trying to tell guys, like, okay, if we've had eel here, you wouldn't want to have probably caviar next. You want some earthy, like truffle to carry on the theme of the evolution of the dishes. Yeah. So the menu has got a storyline and it's got like... Um, a whole reason to put 11 dishes together. It wasn't like, yeah, let's throw some really expensive ingredients through in, charge this, they'll think we're amazing. But yeah. for me, it's always been a bigger picture. It's about the symphony of 
storytelling, music, it's always been about you start here, you might start with a hit, you might start with something a bit softer, then you look at textual, then you look at the main course as a finale, you look at the the crossover after the main course takes you slowly into dessert. So every single dish, one to eleven, is a reason for it being there. But then you give that responsibility to the team. Say, okay, what should we do in dish seven? What should we look at? That's called the crossover, savory to sweet. What could be good that's not too sweet, not too savory, but it changes your palate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that... There are certain ingredients out there. I once, I once got asked by a by a chef to find a moon melon that apparently turned everything from savory into sour. Turns oh, really? Out, yeah. It turns out this fucking thing never existed. It was a Photoshop melon turned blue. <laughs> but <laughs> I was like, that would do. That would do fine for uh, for any menu. But there are ingredients out there. But that's what that's where I fell fell into the food industry. It was being inspired by ingredients like um, Copper Crest. They, I know they're yeah. a Dutch company, but they do uh, Zelotti Blossom, which is I believe it's uh, not shiso, but it's like um. It's a session bud. Se- session. Oh yeah, the, the the buzz buttons. I mean, they're next level. Yeah. Like you blitz those down with some sugar and you ruin a martini glass, and you've got one hell of a <laughs> cocktail there. But like you know, they do zelotti blossom, which is like basil and strawberry. Wow. Uh, and it's a purple flower, and just a couple of buds on that on a dish, and it just take takes you from something that's. You know, it's that crossover period, and you yeah. can put that with a bit of parmesan and a bit of strawberry. Yeah. And honestly, I and I've made it's those sort of dishes that really inspire me. And if you can get the team on board, but again, if you get the team involved in that, and you yeah. say to them the reason why, so you're not telling them. So it's not about teaching them how to cook because a lot of them will be better cooks than me because I've never had the training they have. Mm. But I've just got this creative way to get the best out of them that they've probably never been asked before. They've never been given a chance to shine before. Never been given a chance to have a, a clear head before to say, uh, fuck it, let's do this show. Yeah, okay, let's try it. So one of the things we always say is that, and John's, John's the same as me, I say, listen, like John's been with me 18 years and as a, as a mentor, he's probably one of the strongest guys there. He's, he's responsible for com- some of the most talented chefs in the country because he's he sits with them, stays with them, trains them. And it's just genius to watch a guy so talented and and still want to be there with me as, as, as on my side. But to get a young cook to say, okay, it's going to be two weeks' time, we're looking at changing that element of the dish. Smoked teal we've had on for a while. I think crab's going to be amazing. I spoke to Johnny at Fine Fish. He just said, crab's fucking incredible. What should we do? Something we've never done before. Mm. So that's like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. It's a different kind of pressure, but it's fun. And you've got two weeks to do it, but you can do it every day if you want. Get a crab in, do three different dishes, get another crab in. I'll pay for that. Yeah, because it inspires creativity. And as you and I... Oh, talk, it's fucking you know, incredible like... to watch these guys' eyes light up. Oh, chef, I mean, because I don't, know, don't do what you've done. Think of it, it's like, say it's like September, I don't know, fucking where the crabs are at, really, really good crabs. And you say, it's okay, it's there it's 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 gonna okay november it's gonna be cooler with some crabs really really fresh really plump what would you have in november with a crab um i don't know it's gonna be cold okay would you add a spice element warm or would you have some at root like artichokes do you know what I mean all of a sudden yeah, a bit so many fucking i don't know i'm like fucking hell. so don't talk about it i say let's taste it so a lot of the times i say stop you're telling me like he's written it down, doing a doodle. So let's taste it. Okay, Thursday, present it. And then you can see the flaws in it. You can see the attributes of it. You can see the mindset where they were. You can see things that worked, things that haven't. But guess what? They put the balls out in a safe environment. They were allowed to fail. And that's the key, isn't it? We talked about earlier. Failure should be celebrated. It should be part of the creative process. Failure shouldn't be a negative. Failure is how to get to the next to the best stage is how to get to a level of competence that's you know failure is is trying to me <clears throat> and as long as you're trying you're winning because you're you're doing the best you can it's when you give up and to, to for people to 
be prepared to fail. They have to have a certain level of confidence in order to do that. And if you batted that confidence out of them, yeah, then they're not going to add anything to your menu, anything to your dishes, anything to your restaurant, because they don't have the confidence to be able to say, well, actually, this is my two pence on this, and this is how we do it. And it's like a T-shirt. So we were looking at, um, obviously, we're funded through merchandise sales. And one of the things I was looking at recently is, what new lines of T-shirts can we get? And I was searching chef's T-shirts. And I kept coming up with, um, your opinion wasn't in this recipe as a T-shirt like logo. And I looked at that and I thought, it's popular, but I can't spin it. That behavior, that whole ethos is, your opinion is not in this recipe, is something that we want to challenge as you say and it is about actually your opinion is in this recipe and yours and yours and yours and look that even the even the pot watch who's actually yeah. watched a program last night is coming across to us and said I'll come back yeah mm. have you seen but this how cool is that if the pot watch can come over to you and say chef i saw this incredible program about zambia and they were doing this incredible dish and that's an open forum that's that's the dream yeah, yeah. for me that's the dream scenario where you have everyone talking about food and service and restaurants. Everyone's obsessed with wanting to be the best they can be, not the best in the world, which is bullshit. Just the best. So when they were with us, the time, I want them to look back with nostalgia and thought, mate, it was an incredible one, three, two years that I, I grew. I felt I grew, and now I'm ready for the next role, wherever that chapter is going to take you. Well, as I say, I've come across a few interviews where some of your uh, your predecessors, sorry, your predecessors, your people that you've trained have, have moved on to other places and they speak, um, they speak with that level of enthusiasm and that level of, <laughs> you know, that level of warmth. And yeah, they say, you know, it can, it can be fucking hard at times and you say it how it is. But I think it's about that, as you say, it's the legacy that you, you're leaving. And I want to sort of move on because last yeah. time you and I spoke, we were talking a little bit about not just how you handle staff in terms of how you have a relationship with them and you build and nurture them, but also other aspects. Because I, I got asked a couple of questions when a few people heard you were coming on today. Like, yeah. the question was, he's put a four day working week in place. It must have done wonders for him and his staff. You know, what were the complications? But I think speaking to you more and more and more four day working week is a very small it's a costly and it was a risky yeah. risky maneuver as as you've previously said but it's a very small part of a much bigger piece of pie it's about the communication but you also spoke previously about the fact that you work with the nutrition on staff meals yeah um and hopefully kirk is coming to talk to us kirk harworth about yeah. uh, nutrition <clears throat> and how it impacts and i know obviously he's worked with you before as well yeah because uh, he was very poorly with us and, you know, we, we changed his shifts, we made him go straight shifts, but then mentally it really affected him because he knew he wasn't giving the best he could to the team. So he felt, we didn't mind, we knew, we knew his talent, I've known Kurt a long time and I knew how important he was to the team, but he didn't feel he could give the value he wanted to stay and I got that. And it was a shame that he he left under them. But you know he was ill. He was really poorly, so he needed to sort himself out. And he was a, he's a very talented young man, and I think he's got the world's his oyster. You know he's a phenomenal chef. But he he and both you, I think, share the view with regards to the fact that staff meals and, and nutrition and how you fuel your body is uh, it's so important in terms of how your mental well being and how your physical. It is. It is, and it's. It's, again, how far are you willing to go? That's what my question is all the time. It's, I want to go all the way. Why leave any stone unturned? Why not just keep going? You find out that you can work with psychologists now on staff behaviour. How can you introduce love as an ingredient? How can we monitor the staff's mood on an hourly basis where they can fill in a form? That's what we're working on next. Obviously, yeah, if we were open, we would have done it. But the food aspect, I have a nutritionist uh, called Jo Meadows, me, me and my wife. She's done plans for me, John and, and her. And we want to implement it. So she goes a breakdown of what the food groups were, of how to submit the, the kind of food groups into a menu. Because Amanda Moore is a stickler for getting the menu the week before so the chefs don't start becoming lazy when they're doing the staff food. So it all becomes monotonous and you end up having rice three times a week. So she'll look at the reinforcers, no, it's too similar, pasta there, rice there, no. 
you need to add something there, like sweet potato. So, so that becomes a really important thing. And the reason it started becoming a thing was, you know, when you're away from home and you're starting a new job and one thing you miss is, is the food. So what we thought is how do you nurture a way that if you had a rotor with the whole week's menu on, the beautiful thing for me was when people would look on, say when they got to work Wednesday and I heard them like the front of us to go, oh my God, Friday, we've got paella or something like that. Or, or yeah. they were giddy about the food they're going to eat that week. And it could be like breakfast, we've got Spanish omelette or whatever it is, you know, like chorizo eggs or we've got Thai rice or we've got, and it's all of a sudden the, the, the morale was so high that the, the people that, the staff that eat the meals, they realise that we put them on the same par as the guest. Yeah. And when you have that powerful mentality of you are as important as the guests we're feeding and we need you to eat well because you're going to be with us for 10, 12 hours a day, we're going to feed you twice and we're going to make sure we look after you. And just before we close down, uh, for two months, we introduced energy bars that we made at the restaurant. Because I noticed in the kitchen, the chefs are tasting all the time. So we didn't get a slump. Front of house, the last time they ate was quarter by five, five o'clock. By nine o'clock, you've been walking up and down, you've been serving, you're going to get hungry. So they would probably sneak in and take a bread roll, put it in their little pocket. And I didn't want that because that's just a short, quick release carb hit. And also, it's not very professional. So I said, guys, don't do that. We'll do something. We start making these high fat cocoa, nut, butter, protein bars. And it fucking was incredible. They would get like probably 50 to 150 grams, depending on the day. If it was a Saturday, get a bit more. And their energy level just got this beautiful, slow release energy right through to the end of the night. And it just changed the game. It's mental, isn't it? It's, it, it's just that obvious. That, and I, rang, I spoke to my nutritionist and said, listen, they're really suffering. The front of ours, the, the kitchen's eating. They're tasting all day. They're, they're fine. Front of ours, especially the smellies because they're drinking wine. They're spitting out. They're getting dry. You know, they're going to get acid build up. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you do it? So you actually you give them another snack between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. And that's what we did. And it fucking worked. And it's just so obvious. But it's, again, stop it stopped them then sneakily getting bread rolls or not saying that they would eat off the plate, but, you know, that we've seen it all. I don't want them to do that. They're not fucking mongrels. They're the staff. They're, they're our team. We have to look after them. So by giving a little snack, a little high-protein, uh, high-fat, bar that that they could eat and it was they take it in turns the two of them will go in the back eat it have some water go back out the next two will come in and before you know it by nine o'clock everyone was re-energized oh yeah that was amazing today wasn't it and you cut that dialogue so they're all giddy again and they're all talking about oh my god oh my god that was amazing so you then all of a sudden peaked them again so that it shows their that they're important and it shows like when amanda does the menu and she'll go, no, and she crosses them out. The, the kitchen team, that cook, go, no, how important it is that she wants them to have a brilliant meal. So the, we keep, if it drops, we go like that. If it drops, we go like that. So hmm. we don't let it slide. Do you know what I mean? So you've always got the en energy levels. Because, I, I mean, we've all been there. So I, I used to work behind a bar as well. And... Oh, it'd be brutal. You get, yeah, you look up, it's four deep, and then you realise you're not going to get a break at yeah. all. And then you get to the well, Imagine stage. just nipping out the back for 30 seconds, stuffing this bar, you're fucking on fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need that, don't you? I mean, it's yeah. so much better for you than that high high sugar energy drink where you suddenly yeah, crash, that, like, yeah. crash exactly. 45 minutes later. Yeah, because I eat the same food every day. When I'm at work, I eat one day fish, one day chicken with sweet potatoes, broccoli. So my diet, and every morning I have an omelette, so my diet is the same for four days when I'm at work. So my, yeah. I don't always partake in the staff food because mine's just, for me, I know what suits me better for my training, for all the rest of it. So I have a very simple um, diet. But when I see them eating they're, and they're all giddy and I, 
And then we get loads of books sent from chefs, our friends. And we had one, um, the chef um, at the pie room, Callum, is it? Yeah. And mm. he did a mint, he did a gimma cottage pie. And the staff made it and they were blown away. And I just saw the faces, how happy they all were. So when we get chef's books from all over the world, we then put it into the library of staff food. So then, like if Tom Kerry sends one, I'll give it to the senior chef. So, okay, next month, add this book with the three or four recipes to the staff food. So then we're actually cooking the dishes that the chef's book's got in it. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great way to test drive the book as well. And it fuels also creativity off the back of that, as well as increasing yeah, they the feel that benefit. We're fueling them with different... We keep hitting them with ideas so they're not just left to their own devices and think, fuck, you know what? You know what it's like. You've got your mise en place and you've got to do staff food. But again, doing staff food, we spread the workload. Mm. So there's three or four chefs doing it. And we've just employed a staff food cook. Oh, so yeah. he will do seven in the morning to do breakfast. He will do staff food at 11 and staff food at five. And he'll go <coughs> at six o'clock. That's his job. And he'll do some mise en place for us as well. So, I mean, it leads me quite nicely into another question. I'm, I'm split at the moment because I want to ask you a question about when I started the Burnt Chef project, it was all about get everyone on four-day working weeks. It will sort, sort everyone's mental health out. Yeah, but it doesn't more... work for everyone. It doesn't work. Well, you can't. As a smaller business as well, if there's a, team, a very, very small team. We were lucky because we condensed all the bookings into four days. So we had, we had room to manoeuvre. But if you are full five days a week, lunch and dinner, you're going to lose money. We had to adapt, and again, we're going to have to adapt when we get back after COVID. And we're looking at a completely different way to work, and which, we, which we're not, I'm not going to tell you now, because it, I think it's something that could revolutionise our industry again. It's, it's, some bits of it have been done, but we're going to trial it when we get back on Saturdays. And I think it's, I think, you know, fuck it, we're thinking of opening like from 12 till 7. We just have a rolling service, because Amanda said, if we do Valentine's, Let's open 12 till 7, and then your last table comes in at 7 or even 8 o'clock if the, if the curfew is lifted. You can still do your 60, 70 covers, but you've done it in over a period of a longer day. It's no point as it's been like a peak, mm. but everyone's had a break. Everyone feels fresh. Do you know what I mean? It's like with a restaurant like ours, it's not a, a brasserie, so you're coming for a special. But with COVID, when we were under the restrictions, people coming out for lunch are going crazy. So there's a market there. So how, how do we understand that market? Like if you're coming out for a Saturday, I love eating out at lunch personally. I, I love a long lunch. So I would, I'd come out at one till five or six and have a great long lunch and some nice wine and have a yeah, coffee yeah. and a brandy and then get home for six or seven and watch some shit telly. Do you know what I mean? And fall asleep, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but that, that's yeah. like my ideal scenario. It's it's a yeah it's a completely different way of thinking, and I suppose then you become without cheapening what you do, but you become a uh, the and, and, there, and, the, the standards and, there. Entertainment. Also, why not? Why have the staff work until two again? Yeah, yeah. How yeah. does that benefit? If they're all home by eleven, then they're refreshed and ready to go. Oh again my god, the next they've day. got like fucking ten, twelve hours off, which is like again. Look at COVID. We've got to take the best bits of it. Yeah and adapt and address and instigate. There's no trial run in this shit. You just got to feel it, put both feet in. Like when we did four days, Amanda goes, Sam, we should do four days. And we spoke to our accountant and he goes, you could lose up to 240,000 a year. We thought, fuck it. And we, and we didn't trial it. We jumped in. Just pulled the trigger. You just got to fucking do it. Because again, we've got no backers. We haven't got to sell it to anybody. We told the staff, Amanda did a brilliant move where she took all the staff together in the, in the bar. And she goes, guys, got some news for you, so you're going to want to know this because uh, we've we found a buyer. We're, gonna, we're leaving. <laughs> it was fucking... I didn't know she was doing it. So my mouth was like, what the fuck? And then she went, not really. We're going to go to a four-day week. You're on the same salary. It means this, this, this. Your, your holidays will be from 28 days down to 22.4 where it works out. But you're going to be working four days a week. They're like, what the fuck? Where's the catch? No catch. Yeah, yeah. And retention. You keep people longer. I wanted to ask you about the... I was chatting to Luke from Limewood fairly recently. Yeah. Home Hotel. 
he has had a, a dramatic improvement on his retention of staff similar sort of things to the way that we're speaking now in terms of identifying that human beings work within your business not numbers that you just capitalize through as a result of perhaps not just the four-day working week but the way that you engage with your staff and you manage them how have you found i mean how is your retention rate at the moment because we are incredible i think it's an average of two and a half years is it really it's mental you know i've got sushi up in there three and a half years john been there 18 had a smelly there for seven years it's amazing and again you you're gonna get guys that i've always said as long as they're motivated and they see that they're improving and they see that you're not stagnant. Like the biggest, the biggest problem I have is if I stop still. Do you know what I mean? Because, because there's nothing left then to to get excited about. Mm. Because if if they look at you as the boss or the leader, and then you come, hey guys, everything all right? Yeah, we're going to go back to that squab dish or that quail dish because it's March. Then I don't know, fucking I did that last year. Then the chef on that section will go, I've got nothing else to learn now. I need to move on. So if you break all the rules, say, listen, what we're going to do, let's find a new fucking supplier. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Let's look at doing a comfy salmon or, oh, I've never done salmon while I've been here. Okay, let's, let's teach you how to do salmon our way. All of a sudden, they're still learning. Why would I leave here? Why would I leave here if I'm still learning? Yeah. And promotions. Different. Internal promotions was, uh, how, do you, yeah. how do you do your promotions? Because we do trials. We do trial periods. So we say, Someone's been there two years. He's 26 years old. He wants to be a sous chef. He's a, he's a senior at Chef de Party. He wants to go to junior sous. We say, okay, we're going to watch you for the next three months. After that, in that time, we want to see this, 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 this. You've now got to join the senior team. And you've got to act like that. If you see that improvement, you put a date in the calendar. Me and John sits down with them, say, congratulations. Now, you got to act the way you've done for the last three months. And they're fucking buzzing. They get a pay rise, they get more responsibility, and they're now in the senior team. So you try to make see what we do with the senior team is every Saturday we sit down and do a little brainstorming. And then we would invite a junior member of the team as well, but a different one each week. Because I've always believed the junior member could fuck everything up. Because sometimes you get the senior team that are kind of like I don't know, sometimes you find it where they won't always question. They'll just go yeah. with it. Yeah. But then the junior will be giddy because he's got a chance or she's got a chance to say something in this forum of 45 minutes going, oh, chef, what if we did this? And they're like, giddy, there you go. So it's about, fuck, it's about fucking up your own systems at the same time. So I don't then get complacent. I had a similar situation with my management team when I was about 18 and they asked me, I got asked by the director of this business what I thought to the targets that had been put in place. And I said, I think they're too late. They're too achievable. And I could see my boss and his boss yeah. looking at me. They had an easy ride, didn't they? You fucking dick. Like this. And I was like, shit, I've just paved, my, I've paved a terrible career for myself here. But the point was, as you say, you get giddy and you say things that it's, it's evident. It could have pushed harder. We could have worked harder. We could have done more. We could have achieved greater things. So why not? Why who are we? Who are we cheating here? We cheating ourselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, you know, we're not here for an easy ride, but we're you know. Well, we're it's here. not. It's not also about that. It's not about the easy ride. It's about. Did you get the best out of your two years with us? Did I get the best out of you for two years? Mm. Did you find yourself coasted? Did you find yourself you could have given a bit more? What you wait? One of my things that I always say is, what are you waiting for? What the fuck are you waiting for? Your next job? What are you waiting for? So I give you the best tools, the best equipment, the best ingredients, the best hours, the best food. You just got to turn up and perform like a footballer. Yeah. The next yeah. thing I might implement is a bench for subs. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same with a rugby team. Yeah. Off you go. If you're not performing, you come off. Someone else. You've got no excuse. What, what's your excuse? Oh, chef, I... No, there isn't one. Because what we did years ago is me and John eradicated all the excuses backwards. So only got one Vita prep, no, you've got four. We only got two Thermomix, no, you've got three. So there's never an excuse. And then we did, we did things like whoever, whoever used the Vita prep had to clean it and then cling film and sign a name on it. 
so it's traceable. Yes. So it's all these little implementations that help run a kitchen that there's no bullshit bitching and fucking old chef, this, that, the other. When he's got the bar to prep four hours and oh, you get the other one. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you've just, uh, and don't get me wrong, it's a fucking cost. Because it's not, it's not, it's not something I fell onto. I know we've had to work hard to get for four vita breaths and three fucking uh, whatever they are, you know. Uh, but the the fact was, it I knew how to run kitchens. I knew how people work. I know how to get the best out of them. So give them all the tools they want. Take all the excuses away. All that's left is their vulnerability as a performer. Performance is what I'm judging you on every day. And if you've got nowhere to hide you then expose your weakness, then I can work on you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's one of the, and, and something that you've mentioned a couple of times now, it's about being responsible for your own shit. Yeah. Like taking responsibility and going, rather than finger pointing, and going, it's his fault, it's that fault, it's this isn't available, this is done this way. No. What can I do to change the outcome of this situation? And how can I Like do I said before, because we had a, a meeting before, Last year, and it was, it was about, I was probably just fed up. And I go, listen, we are all here responsible for everything. And I said to you about that, that everyone's responsible for everything. And as soon as you implement that psychology, there's no like, oh, yeah, John will sort it out because he's a head chef. No, 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 no. Who saw it? Yeah, I saw that about three days ago, chef. Did you have to do it? And I forgot, well, that's not good enough. Mm. This is why you're here. This is your house. You need to take care of that house. After you it. know, I push the path before the guests get there because I love it. Because I'm proud and I want to show these fuckers that when I got my front of ass that fucking standing there looking at, looking at the pebbles, I was, I'll do it. Then one of them took the brush off me and I was like, no, get off. You do the next one. You know, one, you know- guy, one, one French sommelier came from Le Manoir and he, his eyes nearly fell out of his head his first week because I was pushing the path. And he goes to our head smelly, who was a fucking brilliant massive smelly in Laurent. He goes, the fucking chef is pushing the... And he, says, yeah, he always does it. And he couldn't get it. <laughs> but then he, he was there two years, and you see him turn. And he almost became like, fucking hell, this is, this is our house. We've got to be responsible. We are everything. We're accountable. We are responsible for everything. If I see the fucking curb that's been broken by a lorry on the, on the street, I've got to inform somebody like the gardener or tell a senior member of the team, say, listen, there's a curb broken. Because one, one thing we've always noticed is that I've never wasted time getting things done. So if the fire's broke and it's unfixable, I'll get a new one straight away. So it'll, it'll come within 12 hours. So I've never been one of these guys that's had things break and then leave it. Yeah. So I've always, always had a very high maintenance list of getting on top of it. Like the carpet Johnny's boat, fucking ring him. Chief, need it sorted tomorrow. Yeah, I'm on my way. The induction boat, done. The, the, the stove's boat, done. And, I, and I've always, again, not trying to... I think that's my responsibility. That's mine and Amanda's responsibility. I don't want to shirk my responsibility to say, well, Chef Newbury, he did fuck all. No, 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 no. You got the fucker done in 12 hours. Mm. So yeah. you didn't have to suffer. There's, there's something we hear time and time again. It's about chefs who are working in conditions where they have only got two rings out of six. And, yeah. you know, they're working with a rationale which decides to play Jingle Bell songs and not actually cook anything, you know? Like, <laughs> they're constantly fighting that. Um, I was diverging at one stage about asking you two questions. We've covered one of them off. The second one is, when you wrote your book... Yeah. I mean, obviously, it was, a, it was a mixture of a sort of cookbook plus autobiography. Did you find the process in any way cathartic? And the reason why I asked this is that I started only recently. I've always talked to people about journaling. I'm like, for your mental health, you need to be journaling, writing things down, because especially as blokes, stereotypically, we're stoic. Yeah. We don't talk about shit, and we're not used to being um, open. <clears throat> But I've actually started to journal myself recently, and I find mm. that even for myself, it allows such a level of clarity. And I was wondering, whilst you were writing, did you have any sort of paradigm shifts, any moments where you went, fucking hell? How, how old are you now? I'm 32. 33. Fuck, okay. 33. So what happens with, with guys, and this is my experience, is we hit 40. Uh, I think 40 to 44, we have a meltdown. 
And I think something happens whichever way you want to work it out from childhood or things that have happened to you, whatever, and you go through the crisis. So I've found four friends, and they're all chefs, and I've gone through this and I've been able to help them because I took therapy when I was younger, about six years ago, and then I've got a life coach now, which is the best thing I ever did. So I'll pass that information on to people that I see suffering because a lot of them think I can't sit. I should be doing that, I should be thinking like this, I just want this. I like, no, no, that's not normal. That's normal, but it's also not normal not to do anything about it. Mm. And that's the key because I look at, like, I've got a personal trainer because I want to get fit, I want to stay fit, keep me focused. I'm not 100% in my head, I need to get sorted. You, you ask for help. You, you don't just fucking clam up and think it's going to sort itself out because some of it could be really deep rooted. So chefs, I'd probably say between 38, 39, right through to probably 40, 44. So I wrote that book 2013. So I was probably 43, 4. So I did find it therapeutic to understand my journey, but I was probably going through a lot of stuff at the same time. So I didn't understand it all. So it's only in the last probably three years I've had really serious clarity to then allow me to be hopefully a better mentor, a better chef, a better person in life because I've had help understanding my thought processes and what triggered certain aspects of my behaviour. Yeah, yeah. And that's something you have to learn. But it's absolutely normal. It's absolutely what everyone goes through, but it's not spoke about. And that's where I think a lot of the stigma involved with men <clears throat> is they're supposed to be this and this, they? we're not supposed to be anything we're just supposed to be absolutely human we have feelings we have needs we have to understand that some some people will cry for help through alcohol through drugs and all the rest of it but there's always an underlying reason why someone is doing something excessive and that's what i've learned and that's what now i try to look for in my friends with my staff and I can pass that on, and I've and I've done that, and it's some of the best advice I've ever been ever passed on because I didn't know about it. I, again, almost self-taught. I had to go in there blind, knew something wasn't right, then realised actually this is the path that I'm at now. I'm at this stage in my life where I've got to look, look back, got to look, go through some times I don't want to, and then come out the other end and go fucking hell. Thank God I did that because it could lead to such destruction as, as you've probably heard stories and all the rest of it. But it's about acknowledging it and, and talking about it and knowing that it's okay and knowing that that's normal. Because yeah. for so long, I, I was thinking I was abnormal, but then I realized I was absolutely normal. And that was the trigger. Do you know what I mean? And you've only too well. I mean, that's the whole reason why I started the Bird Chef Project. I think I went through, I mean, I did go through a crisis when I was 28, hmm. um, huge crisis. I changed jobs, I moved areas, and I completely and utterly lost, I lost myself, lost yeah. it. I went home and asked my wife for a divorce out of the blue one day because it just got in my head that yeah. the life, my life was different, um, didn't belong anymore. And I actually went and got some help. Some, I went to see a cognitive behavioral therapist and she sat down and she said, you know, what's going on? And I was like, well, this is it and this is that and they're different and I want to be more like them, but I also want to be more like them. And she's like, you, you're you perfectly normal. Like what you're yeah. going through, yeah. normal. <laughs> well, but we need to, someone to tell us that because we don't know. Yeah, 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 we don't. We don't have a clue. And, you know, actually you end up after going through that process becoming a lot more comfortable with yourself. Oh, God, it's and, incredible. Because obviously as a as... As you know, I, I'm known, I'm a big chef, I fucking train, I'm a big guy. So there's all that bullshit involved with it, like stigma of fucking only solid, he's strong. Man, we're all fucking vulnerable, we're all weak, we all need help. We all need to cry out for help and, and get help and professional help. And that's strength to me. Yeah. Asking for help is the strongest thing I ever did. Yeah. And that's, I, that's how I feel. And then when I speak to, you know, my chefs and my guys that are going through shit and I know, listen, you ever thought of going to speak to someone? They go, no. And we also introduced, I think four years ago, we introduced a health plan for the staff. And there's three tiers. So you, your first year you get tier one, tier two, after two, tier three, which is like you get six hundred pounds towards dental, feet. So things like, you know, that will really help them. And all of them, including tier one, had therapy. 
So I made sure that they all had like, I think you allowed six hours. Yeah, yeah. So every time I saw a struggling chef, I would say, listen, you know that WP plan I've got you? On that sheet, if you ring that number, there's a therapy line that they'll never come to me. It's you. Who can act there? There's no way. And some of them have used it. So then allowing and understanding that I was going through stuff, but I had no one to go to, but then I can see someone struggling to then say to them, listen, that plan we've got for you, that you, you've done a year with us, now you're part of this plan. There's some, you can talk to someone. Fucking hell, what a lifesaver for me, because it means they are talking to someone. Yeah, yeah. And they can reach out to an independent, unknown, that's not their parents, not the boss. Because all you sometimes need is to sort of fucking blurt out shit yeah. and someone just to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell them to turn around and say, actually... Yeah. You're absolutely normal. Yeah, that's cool. Because and that you- was the catalyst for me. Like, fucking hell. I'm normal. And I was like, yes. Because I thought I was fucking <laughs> abnormal. <laughs> Yeah, but we, we spend, we spend. I think society dictates now that we should fit into these certain structures. You should be this, you should be that. You talk about your physical appearance or your place within work and, you know, you should be, you should be this quintessential. And it's almost like stepping back into like the Victorian times where yeah. men, men were stoic and women were, you know, they were married off during seasons and all this sort yeah. of stuff. But actually we are just flesh and blood we're all built the same yeah. way and i think that's the key for me that's been the biggest learning curve of the last few years and it's the best journey i've been on so yes being a chef is phenomenal but being a better person is the ultimate goal and, and, and understanding people and nurturing and you know i miss my team you know I'm, i see them but we're not in the kitchen and we're doing mama Baines, and that's good but not to be in a kitchen surrounded by your team that you've handpicked and their, all their characteristics and idiosyncrasies of how they work and how they tick and one's really quiet in the morning till 11. You know, I miss all that shit. And, and, and because they're part of my fulfilment, do you know what I mean? I, I like seeing them and the smile on the face when I walk in and, chef, oh yeah, we did this last night. And I'm like, oh, fucking hell, sounds amazing. You know, and you, you, we've lost that, you know, because... Yeah. With COVID, it's been such a weird, weird time, but we're still keeping them all. But I was thinking this week, I swear to John, I goes, what we'll do, we'll give them all tasks um, and a group to do ideas for spring, just in case we're back for, for March, April, May. But we've got a head start. So that will be juicy to get someone going, oh, yeah, I thought about this, yeah, I thought about that. And I think... That creative process doesn't have to be like so actual as in round the table. It can be like, you know, from remote on a group that everyone's got a saying. And when you're probably doing it by text, you can be more confident. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because so from the, from the lockdown, you can still look at benefits on how we can adapt how we do things. So it's about, that's what it is. It's about not falling into a stereotypical way of thinking because there is no way of thinking. That's, it's got to be everything and, and still being able to learn and process. Like with COVID, we've had to learn adapt. We're doing Zoom meetings. We're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. So, okay, what do I like about this bit? I like this, I like, I like that. So I'll take that. But then ultimately make a new way of, from this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I was chatting to a friend of mine um, the other day and we were talking about uh, where we learn in the academic system and how we're taught as as children and not to do things and don't do this because it's bad and don't do this. And when you go to school, you know, you, if you're a creative, you tend to get stifled because it's not within the curriculum and you have to behave in a certain way. Yeah. And I think you hit a certain point in life where, and I feel like I've got there myself, where actually you make your own rules. You take lessons that other people have have left behind so that you're more effective and you're more efficient but ultimately you question why and you question if the way of working is the correct way and again you know it goes back to setting up the Burt Chef project it's about actually challenging people's perceptions on how they believe things should be done yeah just because that's the way they've always been done, you know? and, and yeah but that's just lazy and you're living proof of that as well. So, but it's laziness. It's it's the cop out. It's not giving full value of yourself to someone by 
following someone else's rules and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's how you know, don't know, don't be silly. Because the truth is, you may not know, but I think there's nothing bad in saying, listen, I don't know, let's have a look. Because it shows vulnerability, it shows that you're not the fucking or all singing or dancing. You're, you're actually part of a team that's being creative and learning. And as soon as you attribute learning to progression, fucking hell, the world's your oyster. That means we're all learning together. So one guy at 22 could be learning something I'm learning at 49 at the same time. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. got to be fucking, that's just such a leveler. That for yeah. me makes everything sense. Yeah, it does. And to final, final, to finish this up, to appreciate, you know, your, your time is important. I, it's all right, it's all right. I always ask my guests one question, which I'm always intrigued to hear the different answers. <laughs> which, and it's very, very simple. The question is, is if you were to provide some advice to an 18 year old version of yourself, what yeah. would you be telling yourself now, knowing what you know? I was told some advice at 21 by a guy called Medic. Bellamy, who's passed now, and I worked for their restaurant. And he said to me, Sat, he was a restaurateur. So he goes, Sat, do yourself a five year plan and do yourself a 10 year plan. And every year, just look at it and see if you're on track. That's all he said. And 10 years ago, I met him and I saw him somewhere. And I said, I followed what you said. And it's where I am, um, where I am now. And he was blown away because he couldn't remember saying it. <laughs> so it's amazing how someone could be just off the cuff, give you some information, but it resonates. Because I'm not from gastronomy. I'm not from this world of cooking at home and all the rest of it and then working for all these brilliant chefs. I'm, this is new territory for me. It always has been. But it just shows you with some will, sacrifice, desire, you can do whatever you want. And the only reason I can say that is because I'm living proof you can do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there's no rules. As long as you are willing to work hard and do not deviate from your plan. So do yourself a five-year plan at 18 and say, I want to work. By the time I'm 21, I want to be, I want to be in a one-star. I, I want to be I want to travel. I want to do this. But then do a 10-year plan. When I'm 20, I want to be a head chef of this. I want to have a new restaurant. And every year, look at it. Are you on track? And if you're not, do some about it. It's great advice. That's good Cheers. advice. <laughs> it's, it's I, I love I it. I still I, do it now. I still do it now. I still have a five year plan and I look at it and I make sure we're on track. It just resonates. I mean, I did something similar before starting this. I, I used to write three things down in the morning and three things down in the evening and I wouldn't look at it again. I just write it down, get it out of my head. And it could be like, it could be extrinsic, like I want to own a yacht, or it could be I want to solve world hunger. I'd write it down, and no matter how big or small it was, I'd put it away in the drawer. And over time, these things would change, and they would morph and adapt. But one of those one was, you know, change, change the hospitality industry. And yeah. Health, we'll something that we talk about. And I, that was three years ago. Um, wow. And I quit my job. But like I said, I don't, do, I don't do many podcasts at all, but I know how important this one is, and, and I really appreciate you reaching out. No, I appreciate you having on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And hopefully once COVID fucks off for a little bit, I can yeah. um, come, up, <laughs> come up and say hello personally. No, definitely. Take care, man. Thanks for your time. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that was quite an interesting chat there with Sat. We covered a lot of different topics. And it's interesting to see that he has changed the way and the dynamics that a hospitality or restaurant business should operate. Certainly focusing on staff well-being, management, inclusivity, health, and time off. He definitely seems to have got the right setup for this. And there's a lot of things there that I think we can take from this. I hope you enjoyed the chat. And join us again next week as we interview another guest. For more information on The Burnt Chef Project, head over to www.theburntchefproject.com or check out our social media channels on Instagram and Facebook.